Um, yes, uh, there is a bit of a division of labor between Anne McShane and myself, and uh, you'll see how that emerges. But what we'll do in the discussion, I'm sure, is, is take up all of the points made by the comrades. Um, the elections in Northern Ireland the other week, um, the outcome of them was in many ways, um, a, you know, an event that had long been expected. Uh, opinion polls for several months had been predicting uh, Sinn Féin being the largest party. And in particular, the, um, the relative decline of the unionist uh, parties, or at least a, a shift between the different unionist parties. Likewise, there was uh, a much uh, hyped uh, emergence of the Alliance Party, a sort of so-called cross-community neutral uh, third force. So the actual results weren't really a very big surprise. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a, a shock at all. And indeed, the, the general tendencies that um, uh, appeared in the elections had been really uh, developing uh, since 2017, and we might argue uh, in many ways from uh, earlier um, uh, earlier than that. Um, what I want to argue this evening is that this was not so much an election which saw a triumph for Sinn Féin as a a uh, decline in uh, certain sections of unionism and a crisis for unionism, and perhaps more importantly, reflect, reflecting the underlying crisis in the six counties of Northern Ireland. The headline of our article was crisis in permanence. And I suppose, um, as many commentators said before the election, um, predicting the post uh, election crisis or the historical dimensions, Every election in Northern Ireland represents a crisis and every election is an historical election. But I want to argue that this election is significant and uh, it has a number of quite contradictory features uh, within it and uh, features which um, I think do point towards, the, uh, towards the, the, the future. One thing I will say at the beginning, and I hope it will come out in the discussion, is that uh, Certainly in Britain, there's often a tendency to focus on uh, Northern Ireland of politics as a sort of place apart, a unique set of circumstances. And in particular, the only real way that you can make sense of it is to just focus on the minutiae of events in the, in the North. Well, I want to suggest that in fact, what we will see um, uh, as we go through is that events not only in Britain, but indeed in the wider world will have an impact. So obviously the political crisis facing the, um, the Johnson government in Britain, the, the whole Brexit question, how the protocol is to be implemented, all of these relate very much back to, uh, to British politics. Indeed, um, that there have been suggestions that some aspects of the crisis have been engendered by uh, the Tories, Liz Truss versus uh, Boris Johnson, um, the use of the protocol as a political issue to sort of build support for, uh, for the Conservatives and so on. But there's also a wider uh, context as well I want comrades to bear in mind, which is of course relations between the United Kingdom as a whole and the European Union. And then more importantly, the context of the relations between the United States and the European Union, its NATO allies, its client states in Europe, and of course the war in Ukraine. And we know that United States strategic interests have been on um, uniting itself, maintaining the unity of its European allies, corralling them and directing them uh, into an aggressive uh, war um, against uh, Russia. So. The need for unity and stability within the, uh, the countries of NATO and the European Union is essential. And so any, any understanding of the sort of crisis that's um, emerging in Northern Ireland, I think has to take that uh, into account. Do, how will the Americans look at a, a possible conflict between the United Kingdom and the European Union if um, Article 16 uh, is implemented? 
But perhaps more importantly, how important is Northern Ireland to the, the, the strategy and the intentions of the British government? And of course, um, south of the border as well, which is another, another factor, another dynamic that we have to take into account. What's the attitude of the Irish state, the Irish bourgeoisie, and I suppose more importantly, whether Sinn Féin can reproduce its uh, opinion poll ratings and become the largest party, possibly the head of a coalition uh, of parties, or maybe even an outright winner in the election south of the border in, um, in a couple of years time. So there are, a number of, uh, there are a number of dynamics and variables here that I think we've got to take into, um, into account. So what I want to, uh, to do really to begin with is to look at that, that, that first part of the, um, the scene I said, which is the crisis in unionism. Um, in, the, uh, in the elections, the uh, Democratic Unionist Party went from being the largest uh, party uh, to now slipping into second place. But perhaps more, in, perhaps more significantly, is their, their loss of uh, support. They lost three seats. They're now two seats behind Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin didn't gain any seats, but they had the overwhelming a number of first preference votes. The DUP had around about 166,000 first preferences, which puts them, I think, very roughly about 80,000 uh, below uh, Sinn Féin's first preferences. The DUP's vote seemed to go in you know, various directions, but the, 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 the key vote to their right was the loss of, of votes to the traditional unionist voice who gained 7.6% uh, of the first preferences, but, um, uh, and that was an increase uh, of about plus 5%. But that didn't actually show up in, uh, in, in, in the gain in seats. So they still only have one seat uh, there. The other, uh, the other area of, uh, of movement was, of course, the uh, decline of the um, UUP's vote, a very small decline of the Ulster Unionist vote. But again, that had quite dramatic um, impacts. So from the, the once dominant party in the, uh, the Unionist population, had now fallen back um, into fourth place. But the other, the other area of political movement that uh, has, has been you know, much commented on is the emergence of the Alliance Party, the so-called uh, cross-community party, who gained uh, nine seats and uh, gained 4.5% of the vote, first preference votes, and um, they gained 13.5%. So you can see that uh, the, there was uh, some significant movements in the, in the unionist vote. And what I want to do is to try and focus on what's going on there and what that uh, you know, portends. It's very clear that, um, that since the, the, the signing of the Good Friday Agreement and the development of uh, the recent forms of devolved government in 2007, that long-term historic changes are underway in the six counties. The way that this is often expressed is in terms of demographic change. Um, this year's um, census uh, report in, in the autumn, I think, will probably establish that um, people who identify as Catholics um, will be uh, in a small numerical majority. Um, why that's significant, of course, is that Northern Ireland was established um, in a slightly misquoted way, but the, the sense of it, I think, is correct, as a Protestant state for a Protestant people. And it was established uh, structurally to give a majority to Unionists uh, when Ireland was partitioned between 1920 and 1925. At that stage in the early years of the 20th century, uh, the nationalist population represented about a third of the, uh, the population in the six counties. And so the, the unionist position looked to be fairly secure. But of course, in the, uh, in the succeeding 100 years, that 
majority has been uh, eroded and uh, it, it now seems to, I think, be definitely under threat. So the demographic shift, um, uh, along with the reconstitution of um, uh, government in the north of Ireland, the, the consociational system of power sharing and the uh, uh, bringing in of uh, not only constitutional nationalists, but parties which had formerly been Republican and militant opponents of the status quo into, into the government structures. Um, the, the creation of that, uh, that consociational system in many ways pointed to an undermining of, uh, of, of unionist power. It looked though as if um, the DUP would retain their dominance and indeed uh, from 1998 until uh, 2007 they, um, they remained outside, they were, the, they were technically part of the structures but were opponents of the, uh, of the Good Friday Agreement. But after 2007 when they, they again uh, uh, carried out a very dramatic uh, deal involving Sinn Féin, they went into government with Sinn Féin, with Sinn Féin now becoming the, um, the major representative of the, uh, the nationalist population and the DUP uh, becoming the major representative of the unionist uh, population in this uh, so-called power sharing government. Now, alongside the demographic shift, um, which in a sense undermines or undermines the raison d'etre for the existence of Northern Ireland, there is, I think, uh, another set of shifts which, again, has been underway at least since the 1970s. And that, of course, refers to the, um, the insurrection carried out by the Provisional Republican Movement, the challenge to the Northern, Northern Irish state from Provisional Republicanism, the, the Provisional IRA, and then on the electoral plane, uh, Provisional Sinn Féin from the early 1980s. But perhaps more importantly was not, not just the, the provisional movement, but the um, insurrection within that nationalist population. The provisional movement's challenge was, uh, was a significant one, um, simply because it represented a community in revolt, not simply um, a, a small minority of um, armed insurgents. And it was very clear from the early 1970s onwards that if um, the Northern Ireland state was going to continue anyway, if British rule was to, to maintain any form of stability, then it would need to bring in that population and particularly the political representat representatives of that population which had been excluded for so long. And so British governments from 1972 through a, ver a, ver a variety of attempts at political settlement, Sunningdale in 73 to 74, the Anglo-Irish Agreement, and finally the Good Friday Agreement, all attempted to draw the, um, the, the political represent representatives of nationalism into a power sharing regime. Now, uh, and I think we'll talk much more about Sinn Féin, so I don't intend to look at their movement into the mainstream, as it were. But of course, alongside this uh, attempt to draw in the, the nationalist population, there were other attempts to reform the state in Northern Ireland. And indeed, it was that reform of the state, um, in particular, um, British direct rule, which undermined, in some ways, the political basis for unionism. And of course, in bringing in uh, nationalist parties and, and finally the, the triumph of Britain of bringing in Sinn Féin, that posed uh, a political challenge to unionism. So we, we can already see in, the, in that political arena the ending of the Stormont regime from March 1972 undermined that Protestant state for a Protestant people. British legislation, um, various fair employment acts and so on also did something of the same kind. So that British direct rule paved the way for the, the, the new constitutional settlement, 
and then again an attempt to stabilize the situation. There was also, I think, another set of um, uh, dynamics which also undermined unionist power, and in particular undermined the uh, economic and the social position of unionists, particularly um, those, those areas which had been some of the most militant um, uh, opponents of concessions to the nationalist population. Um, industries uh, and um, such as shipbuilding, engineering, textiles and so on, had gone into really quite permanent decline. So the economic basis for much unionism uh, particularly the lo locally based um, capitalists had been in severe decline. You know, a good example of this is uh, Harland and Wolf, the, the famous shipyards, which were in many ways a sort of bastion of loyalism, uh, you know, a place that employed 15 to 20,000 people um, in the early 70s now employs um, a between 500 and 100, it, it varies. And that collapse of economic power, I think, also undermines many aspects of, of, of unionist politics. I would also say that the ability of unionists to um, uh, impose the solutions that they want, and in particular to um, often go into confrontation with the strategies of the British state, has also been severely weakened. Comrades will recall that in 1974, with the strike against the Sunningdale Agreement, uh, uh, loyalists and unionists were in a position to confront uh, the British state. But increasingly, as the 80s and the 90s wore on, that um, was, uh, was no longer possible. And I suppose this then brings us to the, um, the, the proximate cause of the, of the current crisis. And this, of course, is the, uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol and the uh, decision on Brexit. The DUP uh, allied itself very closely with the Brexiteers in Britain, and indeed uh, believed that at various stages during the dying days of the May government, uh, and indeed um, in, in the, the, the whole post-Brexit crisis, that it had something of a whip hand that it was actually in a position to uh, call the shots. And in many ways, it, it did uh, appear to be uh, using, its, using the minority position of the May government to extract uh, considerable concessions. But of course, um, the, the protocol that, uh, that Johnson signed and the, the deal that he, signed, he did in uh, 2019 with Leo Varadkar, the Southern T-shirt, completely undermined the position of the, the unionists. Um, the, the protocol is, uh, is a, 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 a structure which in a sense um, leaves Northern Ireland in a, a particularly ambiguous uh, position in relation to both the United Kingdom and the, 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 the European Union. The, the protocol leaves Northern Ireland within the um, European single market for some purposes, and also um, in, within its customs framework. In other words, Northern Ireland, although it has, quote, left the, the EU along with the rest of the United Kingdom, it has different arrangements. And those arrangements, I suppose, are embodied in the idea of, a, of, a, of an economic border in the Irish Sea. And of course, that economic border, which is established by the protocol, which was one way that the, the overall withdrawal agreement was, uh, was finalised to get Brexit done, as it were, that, um, that, that agreement did uh, seem to uh, many unionists, particularly the more hardline unionists, to undermine Northern Ireland's constitutional status, as indeed I think it you know, clearly does have that symbolic value. So opposition to the protocol became uh, a, a rallying cry. The DUP campaigned on it um, in, the, uh, in, in the recent elections and above all made it a condition uh, of, of uh, entry into any devolved government that the protocol would have to be variously scrapped, ended, changed, 
the language has often uh, has often varied, and indeed the possibilities of some wiggle room uh, around that you know might exist, but you know we uh, remains to be seen. So the um, so the situation then is that uh, the the DUP, having campaigned in this way, um, could not easily go into government without that concession. It particularly couldn't go into government because it had been undermined from its right by the traditional unionist voice. And this again is where I, I come back to the, um, you know, the crisis in unionism. The unionist vote looked at uh, in the general sense, if we take the Ulster Unionist Party, we take the two independents and we take uh, the DUP, um, the unionist vote in Toto still remains uh, the largest single block, but it is divided in three ways. And so that division, and particularly that weakness of the DUP, enables Sinn Féin in that sense to advance. So it's the crisis in unionism, which in a sense has given the opportunity for electoral gains, or rather Sinn Féin staying where it is, but increasing its first preferences. Um, and in you know in that sense opening up the um, opening up the possibilities of uh, of further political change. The other the other trend that I commented on um, at the beginning, and I'll, I'll just conclude on this, is of course the um, emergence of the Unionist Party, uh, the Alliance Party. Now the Alliance Party uh, is often uh, defined in Britain as quote cross community or non sectarian. Um, I prefer, you know, other ways of defining it. Um, the 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 Alliance Party did emerge out of the old Ulster Unionist Party and then the new Ulster movement in the um, in the I think the late sixties and into the early seventies. It. Uh, ostensibly supports the constitutional status quo as long as a majority of the population in Northern Ireland wish it, which does make it unionist. Um, and I, I think that's important to note that it is unionist with a small U and not a, a capital U. So in the sense of it being neutral, it isn't really neutral on the constitutional question. What I think is interesting about it is that it's, it's being um, portrayed as a representative of a new type of politics. And indeed, in the, uh, in the recent comments on the elections, much has been made that there is a segment of the Northern Irish population that does not define itself as unionist and nationalist. And indeed, the argument goes that uh, large numbers of young people have, in a sense, you know, rejected these old, um, these old labels, and that some sort of new type of politics could emerge. Now, if we look at the alliance vote, um, it, it's about 13%. So it's, um, you know, it's not overwhelming, but it is a significant segment. And indeed, if we look at its, um, look at its votes, it, it clearly represents important elements of uh, middle class areas. And, um, you know, it, it it could, as the um, the old sitcom in Northern Ireland, you know, be the sort of nicer sort of people, you know, the sort of people that um, we all wished, uh, you know, would make up the majority in any society. But of course, within that alliance vote, many things are, I think, are hidden. And I think that um, but overstating the importance of this new middle ground does overstate the I suppose, stabilizing factors in the six counties. If we think that this vote is going to grow and that the old sectarian divisions are going to sort of fade away as British politicians pose it, then I don't think we understand both the government structures of the Good Friday Agreement, which were designed to manage the conflict over the constitutional status of the North, but also have the tendency to reproduce them Constitutionally, um, power sharing is structured around the existence of unionists and nationalists. The
the deputy, uh, the first minister, the deputy first minister, the designations in the assembly, the structuring of the, uh, the executive itself, all rely upon communal blocks. So the, the, the system is structured in that way. Whether, this, uh, whether the emergence of this group represents a breakthrough in those blocks, I think is very much open to question. Um, I say that simply through an analysis of the, um, the transfer system, the Northern Ireland electoral system is a PR system. And I think there is a tendency for alliance to be a sort of um, uh, option to keep the, the other side out in many of the, many of the seats. Um, again, those, those of you who are more cephalogically interested will note that the Alliance Party gained, uh, gained a lot of transfers, but usually lower down the, the order, as it were, so that the tendency in the voting was for Alliance to gain seats, the fourth and fifth seat. In other words, that this positive surge for Alliance <coughs> was much less, pardon me, was much less a positive vote and more, I think, part of that, that politics that we are very familiar with. So my, my conclusion here is that the structures uh, in Northern Ireland, the basic political debate about its constitutional future are still baked into that system. And that crisis in unionism that we've talked about, I think won't go away. I think the the difficulties that the unionist uh, party faces, the unionist parties face, are not going to be easy to uh, resolve. And in many ways, we have to look to um, actors outside of the six counties, particularly, I think, the British government. A lot will turn on what the, the, the Johnson government wants to do. Will it attempt, for example, some amendments to the protocol which... Um, will satisfy symbolic amendments, which will satisfy the DUP. Um, will the DUP be able to buy those uh, amendments? Or will, as Liz Truss seems to be arguing, will it go for, in a sense, the abrogation of, uh, of the protocol and then risking the conflict with the EU and a wider uh, co conflict around uh, the conditions of Britain's withdrawal? And then, of course, the, the, the attitude of the uh, United States and its interests in uh, the state, the stability uh, of Northern Ireland will also, I think, come into the picture. So what I think we have then is uh, really, in many ways, a very unstable situation. But also we have a number of tendencies towards stability. And that, of course, is because of the nature of Northern Ireland, because of its its really sort of fundamental division and split about its constitutional function, uh, its constitutional feature. Um, in many ways, it's a very stable instability. It's a, 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 an instability which is built into the constitutional structures. It's been managed before, and I suppose that, that the possibilities of some sort of crisis management will, um, will occur again. But the basic constitutional question about its future, about whether it remains as a part of the United Kingdom, whether it goes into some other direction, maybe towards the reunification of Ireland, its constitutional structures, the degree of power sharing, the nature of that power sharing, all of those still remain um, you know, very live questions. And I suppose the difference in this structure than there may be other constitutional and political structures that we're, we're used to, is that often in, um, in societies and in structures, people are debating uh, you know, the form of government, they're talking about how uh, you know, the nature of the economy, the nature of society. But in the North of Ireland, the basic question is still that of the nature of the constitution. And I think it, it, it will remain so for the foreseeable future, unless some sort of agency, um, and I use the word some sort, uh, um, both in the sense of a, an external force, and as in terms of the British state, the American state, uh, the Dublin government, or the emergence of a political agent from within inside the island of Ireland itself. 
the, the Irish working class, the revival of uh, revolutionary politics in Ireland, all of these are potential agents. But of course, uh, at the moment, they, 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 they're not immediate factors, but they do point to the fact that this, this instability and this crisis is a permanent feature. And it is, is our job, I think, to try and see that, to see the nature of that crisis and to pose political demands and to build a political movement that can, can um, you know, provide an alternative uh, to that. But that's my, my opening and I'll hand over to Anne now. Okay. All right. Thank you, comrades, for this opportunity to speak today. Um, as you've heard, uh, myself and Kevin co-authored an article that's in this week's paper. Um, and it's an article that I myself um, have some differences with. Um, obviously, you know, these are questions that need some discussion. And um, there are issues which are helpful, I think, to draw out. Um, so firstly, in relation to the question of the significance of the election, um, I, th I think um, that this election is a very significant one, not just for Northern Ireland, but for uh, the South of Ireland, for Europe and for continued British rule in Northern Ireland. That's not because I think that it's basically, you know, uh, uh, giving carte blanche to Sinn Féin now that it's the largest party to go ahead and uh, call for a border poll and that the Secretary of State in Northern Ireland, who is the, sorry, of, of Northern Ireland, who's part of the British government, who is the only person that can uh, agree to hold a border poll, i.e. a referendum in the North of Ireland, is going to do that. He has made it very clear uh, in the last few days that that is not the case, that basically nothing has really changed and that uh, the roles of uh, first minister and deputy first and deputy first minister um, are equal roles, and that is actually quite correct. Form in formal terms, they are exactly the same, um, but in in symbolic terms, they are very different. And I certainly think that the DUP have a real problem going into government with Sinn Fein, um, although uh, Robinson. Uh, Jeffrey Robinson said that there was no difficulty with it. He has decided himself not to, in fact, uh, uh, enter into government despite having been elected onto the executive and he's keeping his Westminster seat. So he does not want to face that scenario of, of, of going into Stormont with Michelle O'Neill. Michelle O'Neill, I should say, very much a mainstream politician today. Um, I mean, it tells you everything that the, one of the first people to congratulate the Sinn Féin on their election was Nicola Sturgeon, leader of the SNP. And I would argue in many respects that the politics of Sinn Féin today are very like that of the SNP. In any event, I think that it is a very bitter pill for the DUP to swallow. And I think that the protocol argument, although it's something that they've been objecting to, I agree, um, it's, I think it's a device to make sure that they're not put in the position of having to share power with Sinn Féin. Now, if they manage to get some concessions from the British government, um, uh, or get the British government, as it is at the moment, to make threats to the European Union, then perhaps they will satisfy them. And certainly Boris Johnson, who's going to Northern Ireland tomorrow, is saying that he's calling on the executive to you know, take their seats, get on with government, can be no dilly-dallying around. Um, but at the same time, I think that his hope is by promising that he's going to square up to the European Union, he'll manage to su succeed with that, but who knows? Anyway, so Michelle O'Neill having been elected um, as the uh, leader of the, the, the majority party in Northern Ireland is only in front by one vote, sorry, one seat, I should say. Um, nevertheless, her... Uh, strategy is to present herself as a 
first minister for the entire population. And obviously she is appealing not just to Sinn Féin voters, um, but also to Alliance voters and the Alliance party, um, which Kevin mentioned, sounds, you know, their leader sounds ex very, very like Michelle O'Neill. Um, you know, that they stand for um, more reforms, uh, tackle health, tackle the problems with housing, tackle, you know, the poverty, uh, which has resulted in relation to um, social welfare problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, basically, the recession, or, well, I don't know whether you'd call it a recession, but in the problems, the economic problems of the north of Ireland. Um, so, um, so, yeah, I think it is important. I think it's particularly important because of the fact that here in the south of Ireland, in the Republic, Sinn Féin are on the, riding on the crest of a wave as far as the polls inform us. And not only that, in the 2020 election here in the south, the uh, Sinn Féin TDs, representatives in the Dáil, went from 22 to uh, 30, 37, um, which was remarkable and in shock then, even, you know, because they hadn't been expecting such uh, support and had only stood in, uh, I think it was uh, 44 constituencies. Um, they um, have since then, in terms of the polls, have continued to increase their support. And I've looked at a number of polls before uh, presenting this talk and the, the figures, you know, carry on through. They're at something like, I think it's uh, 37, something like 37% at the moment, um, or 35%, and they're increasing. Um, Mary Lou MacDonald, who's the president of Sinn Féin, um, which, you know, is a national and all-Ireland uh, party, that's, you know, obviously we know there's a division, but that's how they present themselves, and is the only all-Ireland party as far as really in, in, in any functional term um, that exists outside of the left um, has been um, um, very, I suppose, confident would be the word in her approach to how her party is going to do in the near future. Um, throughout the election campaign in Stormont, although Sinn Féin um, and Michelle O'Neill in the North said very little about a border poll, about a prospect of United Ireland under the Good Friday Agreement provisions. She has been making it her business to stress the question. And in the aftermath of the election, she made a call for the Irish government to uh, begin the debate, to establish a forum and to establish a citizens' assembly. Now, anyone who knows anything about Irish politics in recent years will know that there have been a number of referendums, including uh, the watershed referendum in 2018, where uh, abortion rights were established for the first time in Ireland. Um, as part and parcel of holding that referendum, a citizens' assembly was established. Um, the, the Taoiseach at the time was uh, Enda Kenny, who really did not want any changes to the law, did not want abortion rights brought in. He established a citizens assembly, which looked at the question and heard from experts. And the, and the turnaround was remarkable insofar as the people that form part of the citizens assembly were convinced by the experts that women should have the necessary medical care and therefore the right to abortion and made proposals to the government and which ended up in the in the constitutional change in the rights of the unborn removed from the constitution and in legislation being passed to provide abortion within the health service in Ireland. Um, so I think that what Michelle, o, sorry, not Michelle O'Neill, but uh, Mary Lou MacDonald is doing is beginning a political fight for a united Ireland. And that's why she's arguing for the Irish government to take the lead on the question, even though we all know that nothing is going to happen until the, the United Kingdom government uh, agrees to it. 
So she's keeping the pressure up. Um, and she is in a strong position to do so because of the popularity of the party here in the South. Um, their standing now in the polls is likely to lead to them getting uh, 60 TDs in the next election, which will be in 2024-2025, slash um, which would be, if they got that, they would still be a minority government and they would have to rely on others, which would include the left as it currently stands, which I'll get on to in a little while. Now, I just wanted to say a little bit about Sinn Féin's politics, because there is a lot of uh, confusion, I think, about Sinn Féin and what they stand for. And I recently saw uh, the Democratic Socialists of America describe them as uh, working class, supporters of the working class, as I believe they actually describe them as socialists of a type, certainly social democratic, but social democratic of a left variation rather than that of the current Labour Party in Britain. Um, so, for instance, um, when you look at Sinn Féin's website and you look at their 2022 budget, you'll see their cause. Um, basically health, they want improvements in health, which you know everybody agrees with. In terms of housing, they're not calling for a programme of public housing. No, they're calling for more investment in socially affordable housing, which is what all the main parties want. Um, none of them want to return to the days of public housing, which in fact actually was one of the most popular programmes of the previous a Fianna Fáil government um, back in the 30s and 40s. So they're promising 20,000 new homes, which is a really is a fraction of what's needed. Um, so they've got a refundable tax credit scheme. Um, they, um, I mentioned that on, on, on uh, health, um, they want improvements. In relation to the woman's question, this is an interesting point because Sinn Féin were always quite traditional in their views in terms of the old party under Gerry Adams. They were very traditional uh, in terms of uh, women's place within the home um, and on questions of abortion, etc. And in fact, they had a split um, in the midst of the campaign or perhaps just before the campaign for abortion rights and the uh, uh, some a leading TD of theirs went off and formed a party called I Aim To because of his opposition to abortion rights. Now, uh, both in the North and in the South, uh, the two leaders are very pro-women's rights. And in fact, there's a, a current heated debate about maternity care in the South of Ireland, where the National Maternity Hospital that they want to establish to the land is owned by a religious order and the religious order won't just hand the land over to the government. They want to retain some kind of control, even if it's um, as a sort of ginger group um, within the um, committee that's been formed to uh, run the hospital. Anyway, so, uh, so Mary Lou MacDonald is calling for public ownership of the land and for, you know, full autonomy um, of the um, provision of health care from control um, by any religious orders. And so therefore, on that question, um, they're a lot more progressive than they used to be. But in terms of other issues, in terms of questions like, you know, the working class, they stand for what they call rights or, you know, uh, what's a, a real change. And a real change means more rights for working people and um, families. So it's a reformist program, but like a, not a radical reformist program. I really think that any suggestion that this is a working class party in anything but the votes they receive is wrong, completely misguided. And in fact, compared to Sinn Féin, how it was even 20 years ago, it has most certainly moved more to the right. Like there was a period of time where Sinn Féin were involved in the struggles uh, of the working class in Dublin around um, bin charges, which were you know, defeated, but, but also on other questions in relation to housing, et cetera. 
now that's like that's that matter is you know that that wouldn't even come into their um into their minds to go and do anything like that now they were involved a few years ago in the uh, campaigns uh, in the campaign against water charges which was a big class struggle here in ireland but at never at any point did any Sinn Féin representative refuse to pay um, water charges as the, you know, they were never militant in that sense. Okay, so I know that I'm already taking up more time than I expected to, and I apologize. So I suppose what like I'm describing is, um, is a strong, a gain for constitutional nationalism and it's in my mind what you see today is a re-articulation of republicanism just as we had the republican leaders of 1916 and their families and enter into government after 1921 and Fianna Fáil being formed and you know benefiting from that radical past they had that elan now we have that situation uh, which in fame, like for instance, so if you look at Michelle O'Neill, she comes from an IRA background. I mean, strong IRA background. She actually comes from the South. She has that land. She has that support among Republicanism because she comes from within it. Uh, Mary Lou MacDonald doesn't come from that, but nevertheless, many others do. So when the DUP and other unionists complain uh, that we're dealing with the people, you know, who, 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 whose parents, whose families, whose communities fought the IRA war, the killers of the IRA, well, they're actually right. That is where they come from, but they've changed themselves into something that's mainstream, into something that will be acceptable to Irish business, while at the same time continuing to look like they will be new, that they will be radical, that they will be pro-European, and that they will be more left-wing. So in terms of the left, um, the left in Ireland um, at the time of the last election, as I wrote about in the paper, supported the People for Profit Alliance, called for Sinn Féin to form a minority government with themselves and the Green Party and other independents. Basically, I argued at the time that they deliver themselves up to Sinn Féin a left government. That's what they wanted, the formation of a left government. Now in the North, they're in opposition to Sinn Féin and their um, uh, MLA, who uh, was re-elected in West Belfast, um, whose name escapes me for a moment. In any event, he, what he describes is his vote being squeezed because of the move for Sinn Féin to, you know, to, to push the D, to, to become the major party and to, you know, because of the annoyance with the DUP that many nationalists and also supporters of People for Profit Alliance, Jerry Carroll, that's his name, of People for Profit Alliance, uh, people who would have voted for them didn't vote for them, they voted for Sinn Féin. Well, how do they think it's going to work out in the South? You know, they will perhaps get voted in again as TDs, and a number of them already are, but only to support the Sinn Féin agenda. And we've seen time and time again in Ireland, and at the moment, there's another example of the Green Party in power, which basically just carries out the diktats of the major parties who are now in government together, also to prevent Sinn Féin getting into, into power. But what I'm arguing is that the, the, the left in Ireland, including the Socialist Party, who, although they didn't argue for Sinn Féin to form a government, they kept quiet on the question, if it happens, it happens. And, and today I actually listened to a radio, um, you know, political discussion programme and Ruth Coppinger, who was, was a Socialist Party TD, was on it. And there was a discussion about Sinn Féin and how it's going to do and how, how it's doing so well in the polls and likely to be in government, we're likely to have an all Ireland Sinn Féin, you know, two, uh, Sinn Féin in the North and Sinn Féin in the South. She said not a word against Sinn Féin. In fact, she completely avoided the question. So they evidently think that this would be progress. Well, I beg to differ. I think that 
it would be worse in many respects than a Syriza type government um, because Sinn Féin haven't, don't even pretend that they're not going to um, you know, bring about cuts if necessary. We've seen in the North that they've done so. They will do something similar in the South. Finally, in relation to the border poll. Now, the border poll is a mechanism under the Good Friday Agreement. We've already seen the results of the Good Friday Agreement in the north of Ireland in terms of the sectarian divisions. You know, if you're in Stormont, you're either unionist, nationalist or other. Um, and the various, you know, balances within the um, Stormont Assembly means that the majority you know, there is no majority allowed. It has to be representatives from both community and also that there have been so many divisions between the communities, between the populations that have become worse since the Good Friday Agreement. It is a contradictory process and there are other things that have changed and that have opened up. But nevertheless, it's imperialism's answer to the Northern Ireland problem, to the Irish problem. And I think to depend on that as a way to deliver you a united Ireland is foolhardy. The People for Profit Alliance say that first we'll have, we will call for a border poll, but we don't want just any united Ireland. We want a progressive uh, Ireland, but well, how are they going to bring about their demands within the border poll um, strategy? It's a strategy that gives all power to the UK um, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. And then, you mean, do they really think that there's going to be a blank slate, even if it happens, that Sinn Féin and you know other bourgeois politicians aren't going to put their stamp on it, including, including the DUP? I mean, I think it's a total. Um, well, I suppose I think it's a farce, really, to argue that people should support a border poll. However, and I'll just finish. It's certainly the case that there is a national question. There is undoubtedly an ongoing national question in Ireland and in the south of Ireland. The fact that Sinn Féin has been open uh, throughout its uh, last whatever since, since the Good Friday Agreement, but even more so in recent years, openly arguing for a border poll, openly arguing for a united Ireland. When people vote for Sinn Féin in an election, they know that that's what they're voting for. And young people do vote for Sinn Féin. There was, um, and still is to some extent, some fear among older voters about Sinn Féin and the IRA. And, you know, the worry that they would bring instability, which is something that the major parties argued in the last election, that Sinn Féin would be dangerous, would bring about instability, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, that all fed into Sinn Féin's appeal. Rather than putting younger people off, it made them more attractive. Um, you know, former gun runners become politicians and very effective politicians. In fact, uh, many of them are. So. Um, I don't have a proposal, you know, of how we uh, get Irish unity, how the working class achieves unity in Ireland. I think that we do have to discuss this, though. I know that comrades in Britain, you, you will perhaps say that, uh, you know, your only call can be for Irish unity, but perhaps the rest of us here in Ireland and North of Ireland have to deal with it in a different way. Um, I don't think that we should argue that the border poll is a stepping stone to a socialist Ireland in the way that the Socialist Worker Party or Socialist Party do. However, at the same time, I don't think that we can just uh, dismiss it. Um, the, the, the key issue, however, is that we don't have a subjective factor, as Kevin uh, mentioned, and as we stated in the article, there isn't a working class um, movement for uh, a unity. The only way that the working class today express their views is in the ballot box. Um, and, you know, you don't know what questions, you don't know what the question will be, of course, but um, it certainly won't be one that will um, express democracy, as we've seen in the Good Friday Agreement. But I think that we need to 
recognize the change that's taken place, that this isn't business as usual, that of course the bourgeoisie and the government in the south of Ireland are backed by the European Union, that below the border for um, people in Northern Ireland is not just the south, but there's Europe and they voted to stay in Europe. So on that point, I'll just leave it there and thank you very much.